Welcome to the car guys and this week the Porsche 911 992 Turbo S. Now given my relationship with Porsche at the moment there's very little chance that I would have been given one of these to drive so thankfully a friend of the channel Clive has stepped in and loaned me this brand new example. He's only just picked it up and the very first thing he did is bring it down to see the car guys so thank you very much for that Clive much appreciated. So this week we're going to go through this car in detail and I'm going to tell you whether I think it is the greatest usable supercar ever made. So here it is folks, this is the 992 Turbo S, the very latest, fastest, best thing from Porsche and at the moment these things and particularly the cabriolet are impossible to get hold of. Why is that? Well a combination of things but the main reason is a shortage of computer chips. The coronavirus has affected suppliers all over the world and as a result there's not enough chips to finish the cars. In fact many dealers are reporting that you cannot get Turbo S or Turbo S cabs until the end of next year. So it's all the more special that Clive has loaned me this brand new example. It's just gone to the detailers, it's just been PPF'd, it hasn't even had the number plate put back on the front, but he wanted to share this car with you, the Car Guys audience. It's also a particularly timely look at this car because I have just stepped out of the Ferrari Roma and that's a car that's hoping to attract as many of these customers as possible. So literally I can now compare those two cars back to back for your viewing pleasure. And just for good measure, I thought I would put this car next to my 1989 Turbo and take you through how these cars have evolved over the years. Sound good? Excellent, let's crack on. There's been a turbo since 1975 and it's come to mean the top of the range, the fastest of the fastest and the one that many Porsche owners aspire to own. The original was revolutionary and ushered in an era of supercars that you could use hard without them breaking. The 930, which of course I own, refined the recipe further and added a fifth gear. The 964 was bonkers fast but could easily kill you. The 993 added four wheel drive to tame the power of the turbos and each new model evolved and became faster, but also more controllable and more civilized, so that you could floor the throttle with impunity. Unusually for the 992 generation, the Turbo S and the Turbo S Cabriolet were launched at the same time. And right now, demand is far outstripping supply, and not just because every major YouTuber seems to have one. Now, as you can see, this car is in Gars Red, a historic Porsche color, harking back to the days of the 80s stockbrokers Wall Street and excess. We've had a few years to get used to the 992 shape now and of course it is evolution not revolution. The nose is slightly different, the rear has of course that brake light extending all the way around but this is the Turbo S. So the Turbo S traditionally has a huge ass and this is no different. As you can see you've got this big active biplane spoiler, this is also used as an air brake, it's part of the overall aero package. This increases downforce by 15%. So you've got active aero going on here and quite a lot going on here. The rear is dominated by two huge oval exhausts and if you want to see the engine, forget it. There you are, nothing. To be fair, that is like previous cars. It's such a shame though that you don't get to see all the guts of the car anymore. The engine is a 3.8 litre flat six twin turbo, 641 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in 2.7 seconds, 0 to 124 8.9 seconds and it delivers 690 foot-pounds of torque. The grunt from this thing is planetary. As with previous Turbo S's, this is PDK only. It's an eight-speed gearbox and for the first time a Porsche has a wet mode function and this changes the aerodynamics and the balance to the rear axle. So this is it. I'm in the 992 Turbo S and obviously the interior of this car is astounding. And as you can see, in this case, Clive has specified the interior in all black with red stitching, which is another classic Porsche configuration. It's very 80s. There is no finer workmanlike racing office than this car. Everything, and I mean everything, is perfectly tuned towards the driver and in making everything as easy to use as possible. It's so intuitive, it's tactile, 
you've got the perfect combination of touchscreen and buttons, everything works seamlessly, everything just works. They have evolved this cabin to a point where I believe at the moment it is the finest in the world. The steering wheel is perfectly sized and weighted and it's the right thickness. You've got proper stalks, not buttons, for indicators and for windscreen washers. And I think as I said in my 4S review, the keyless entry works exceptionally well, but I like the way that they've still kept the sensation of a key in the ignition when you start it. They didn't need to do that, they could have had a button just like everyone else, but no, Porsche was smart. They knew that Porsche owners who've had cars for in some cases 50 plus years will appreciate the fact that they like to turn a key in the ignition. You've got an old analog reliable rev counter in the center, but now it has on either side two digital displays which can be configured in any way you want and can also be changed to occupy full parts of the screen. So if you want the sat nav to take over, you can. If you want another screen to be dominant, you can do that too. It's very flexible. I have to admit, I was one of those people that really hated the idea of Porsche losing the five analog dials here. I just thought it was so iconic they couldn't get rid of it. But remember, we've still got the old cars for that. In a modern space age Porsche, it works incredibly well because it looks like you've still got those dials, but they're digital. It's amazing. It really is exceptional. The amount of information that I have in front of me is mind blowing. It's like being in a fighter jet. And if you haven't got enough information and lights and warnings and stuff here, you've then also got this touch screen in the center of the console, fitted flush in, no tablet shoved into a dashboard here. It's perfectly flush with the dashboard, perfectly integrated. That is how you do it. And then the software comes into play. It's very intuitive, it's easy to use. You can find anything you want. It's always a series of easy, large finger taps away. If I want the start stop off, no problem. There we go, exhaust, no problem. I've got my wet modes there as well, which I can select using the touch screen or using the drive mode selector. On the right hand side, I've got various icons for all the main displays. There's some climate, how about a bit of car information, this is the phone, here's some media, and there's the sat nav. Personally, I prefer to have the car display on there, so I've got the mechanical stuff to look at. The transmission tunnel does of course have an opportunity for even more style. So we've got the main climate section here and again you've got some digital displays to turn on certain items but then really nice tactile switches to operate the temperature and the fan. Down here Clive has specified additional options so he's got the heated and cooled seats and in the middle of the transmission tunnel is the somewhat controversial Winky. I know I ribbed Porsche mercilessly about the Winky in my earlier Porsche reviews, but actually as time goes by, I've sort of grown to like it. And is it just me, or in this car, is it a bit bigger? I think it might be. What I love about these latest Porsche interiors is that the engineers understand the interplay between touchscreen and real buttons. They haven't just chucked everything onto touchscreens, which is the most infuriating thing in the world. They've kept some analog and others digital. And in some cases they've doubled up like NASA so that you can choose either one. They might have done that a little bit too much though, because as you can see from this display, we've got a touchscreen with the exhaust on it and immediately below it is the analog exhaust button. That's maybe a little bit too close, but I have to say, I applaud Porsche for leaving in proper buttons and they're really beautifully machined and very tactile. They're a pleasure to use. And the most important thing about them is that of course, because they've got these knurled edges, you can easily find them while you're keeping your eyes on the road. You don't have to look around for them. Rear accommodation is of course pretty good in these new 992s because they are slightly larger cars, but you're still not gonna fit any NBA players in there. It's also quite interesting to see that Clive has decided to go for red seat belts. I've not seen red seat belts since my MG Metro in 1983. But that's enough talk about the interior and exterior of this car. It's time to drive it. Now this is of course the Turbo S, so it's the top of the range, it's the best of the best, the fastest of the fastest. So there are two immediate first impressions. Number one, it's actually very quiet, and number two, it's actually quite stiff. This seems 
a lot stiffer than the previous generation Turbo S. And that seems to be in keeping with Porsche's current philosophy. The brand new GT3 is a lot stiffer too. It does give the car a little bit more of an aggressive edge, perhaps more like my beloved 997 Turbo S, which was harsher than the 991 that replaced it. I'm loving seeing all that guards red all around the place. It's such a historic Porsche colour, and so many of these cars are silver or black, so it's good to see something in such a bright colour. Now, we're fully warmed up, and I think it's time, and in Clive's honour, we shall give this the beans. Are we ready? Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much just ruined my neck muscles. Oh. <laughs> my God. Well, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to report that the Turbo S remains a neck-snappingly fast Porsche. I'm sweating now. I am sweating now. That is how I imagine that takeoff on Concord must be like. It's unearthly the way that it just puts down that power. When it's dry, there's no need for something as crude and primitive as traction control. It just relies on good old fashioned mechanical grip and good old fashioned ironmongery in the back, rocketing us forward. The brakes in the Turbo S are, of course, the stuff of legends, and these are no different. If you want to stop really quickly, these are the anchors that you need. The incredible thing about the Turbo S, and it's always been the case, is that it matches four-wheel drive to ludicrous power. Now, we've got 641 brake horsepower, four-wheel drive, and when you press the accelerator, all of that power is seamlessly transmitted straight to the tyres and the road. It goes like a rocket ship, just like its predecessors. Now here we are driving through the beautiful little village of Burley, and I'm demonstrating right now one of the other things that the Turbo S is exceptionally good at, and that is being used every day and being driven quite casually when you want to. The Turbo S is the epitome of the usable supercar. You can pootle around in beautiful villages or you can blow the doors off pretty much anything else on the road. It's your choice. And although the 992 is marginally larger than its predecessor, it still doesn't feel like an enormous car when you're driving it. Partly that's because the dashboard is low and you've got good glass all round, so it's unintimidating to drive but also you can see the edges of the car really well. The wings aren't as pronounced at the front as they used to be in the 964 and 993, but you still get a good sense of where the car starts and ends. Through the wing mirror, I can see one of those ducts that's sucking air into the engine in an attempt to cool it down and also drive it on harder. The steering has a satisfying weight to it and it's very direct. The car is very pointy. The grip is immense and the overall driving position is just right. And certainly compared to the Ferrari Roma that I've just driven, it feels smaller, it feels more manageable on the road. And actually this is a good time to talk about the Ferrari Roma because I'm pretty sure that Ferrari is targeting people just like Clive, owners of the Turbo S, to get into that car. They're similarly fast, the Ferrari obviously has more pizzazz, but the Turbo S has a lot more actual ability. Incidentally, you might be expecting me to criticise the noise of the Turbo S, but to be honest, they have always sounded like over-eager washing machines. They're like jet engines. You get the power, but you get no oral stimulation. You just get this big whoosh, and then ultimately, wind noise. It's just how they are. And to be honest, I wouldn't really want a car like this to all of a sudden have a sort of blah V8 AMG roar. This car is all about efficiency and engineering. It's like a finely sculpted scalpel. It's got one job, and that's to destroy any road or any other opposition. This car's got plenty of active aero on it as well, which we've not seen before. Anyone who's ever been in a McLaren 675LT will know just how much difference that makes in that car, particularly the air brake, which of course this car now has. That spoiler doesn't just keep you down, it slows you down as well. I used to have a 997 Turbo S in GT Silver, and it was an incredible machine. 
nothing could touch it, very few things could keep up on the road, it was immensely capable, you could drive it in all weathers, it just dealt with it. And the reason I got rid of it in the end and traded it in for a 458 Italia was because all of that competence comes at the expense of excitement and passion. These are not passionate cars, they are bought very much with the head, not the heart. They do everything exceptionally well, but you don't tend to love them like you love cars that perhaps have more flaws or provide some level of tinglage in every time you get in them. Turbo S's are rarely cars that you look back at when you walk away from them, but they are one of the finest cars ever made, no question. If you remember in my 4S video, I came away feeling a little bit underwhelmed by the fact that the 992, though beautiful and well executed, wasn't that exciting. At high speed, you didn't really feel it, and it's the same with this car. You can drive this car at 150 miles an hour, it will feel like you're doing 60. After a while, the fact that it can basically blitz pretty much anything on the road does get a little bit tiresome. You don't really want to drag away from the lights every single day. Sometimes you just want to waft. The problem is, everyone really wants to race you. You get Tesla drivers, for example, desperately wanting to prove how fast their cars are. And yes, they are very fast for a bit. Then this wins. I think Clive's car is wonderful. It's a fantastic example of the breed. It's technically one of the best 911s that's ever been made, but it's not one of the greatest. And here they are two Porsche 911 turbos. I thought it'd be interesting to show you how the 911 turbo has evolved from the 1989 turbo that you see here to the 2021 Turbo S. And don't they look fantastic? Biggest differences you notice straight away, obviously the size. So here's a few stats for you. 1989, 2021, five speed manual gearbox, although the majority were of course four speed, eight speed PDK only, 3.3 litre single turbo, 3.8 litre twin turbo, 4.9 seconds 0 to 60, 2.7, 162 miles an hour, 205, and 325 brake horsepower versus 641, nearly double. As you can see, the 1989 car is much thinner. It also has more prominent wings and it's an iconic shape. Whereas of course the 992 is an evolution of the 991, which wasn't particularly distinctive. And in terms of the tires, it's a similar story. 16 inch on the 1989 car, 20 on the front, 21 on the rear of the 992. And the interiors couldn't be more different too. On the earlier car, the buttons are cascaded all over the cabin with no rhyme nor reason. Some of them are impossible to get to from the driver's seat. I'm looking at you, fuel filler cap. But on the 992, it is peak ergonomics at its best. One of the best cabins of any car. Isn't it fabulous to have these two cars next to each other? Two icons reunited at last. The 930 and the 992. So what do I like about this car? Well, that's easy. I like the speed, I like the dynamics, I like the steering. I like the fact that it's very usable. I like the fact that there's a decent amount of space in it. I like the fact that the cockpit is incredible and works so well and it's very intuitive and everything just works. And I like the fact that you could take this on a GT cruise across Europe or you could take it to a track and it would perform incredibly in both scenarios. It truly is one of the greatest cars on sale today. And the downsides, well, it really just comes down to the fact that all of that supreme competence comes at the expense of passion. It's not a tremendously exciting car. And interestingly, I've just been whacked in the groin by the door handle, which has seen fit to pop open because I'm standing next to it. But on every other level, it is exceptional. It is the pinnacle of Porsche technology right now, and it deserves to be. So there you go. This is the Porsche 911 992 Turbo S, one of the fastest and most accomplished supercars in the world. I think it's an absolute weapon and I hope that I've been able to convey what it's like to drive one of these things in this week's episode. If you are asking me to choose between the Ferrari Roma and the Turbo S, this basic price is 160, the Roma is 170, but option them up and you are looking at around about a 200,000 pound purchase for both. Out of the two, I have to say, I think I'll probably go more for this just because it's such an iconic shape and the dynamics and the interior is so spectacular. It is an incredible car to drive and for that everyday supercar use, this 
is hard to beat. The Roma brings more passion to the equation, but in a straight fight out to get into the car guy's garage, I think it would have to be one of these. So thanks for watching this episode of The Car Guys. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it useful. Thank you once again to Clive for loaning me this car today. You, sir, are a gentleman. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe, leave comments and likes. There'll be another Car Guys episode along next week.